Well, this evening we're very pleased to have Rob Sherwood uh, to speak to our group about uh, receivers, their performance. Uh, as many of you, uh, I would think almost everyone knows, Rob publishes a, a list and, and um, I, I think we all look at it to see where our transceivers or receivers are on, on his list. And um, he assures us that even though we might be seventh or eighth or 10th or 12th, we're still okay. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and not to worry about it. But there's a, a lot of information that uh, Rob has put together over the years, a lot of research. Um, and uh, I was so glad when um, uh, Lloyd uh, in 9LB uh, told us that he had chatted with you and you had agreed to speak to us uh, um, this evening. So, Rob, without any uh, further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, very good. <clears throat> By the way, there is, there'll be one short break, about 40% in, just so you could uh, ask a question or two and be sure I'm not talking into a black hole. And it's kind of hard to remember questions of, you know, 40 minutes ago or something. So I've been testing receivers for a long time, but now more and more attention has to be paid to the transmitters because as you just said, there's so many fine receivers today. So sometimes we'll find that um, if we couldn't work something, it was because of a guy's transmitter that was just up the band a little bit. So the question that I get asked, when did I decide to start testing radios? And really it was a fluke. I never woke up one morning and said, I think I want to test radios. But uh, Kay at our age in Cincinnati, and i that's where I used to live and as a teenager, we had uh, Drake R4Cs and the reviews were good and we'd use them in the 160 meter CW contest and they were terrible. So th the question was, the testing obviously was not approximating the real world. So at that point, everything was a 220 kilohertz test that was in the ARRL. And that just wasn't adequate for the more modern architectures. It was fine for an S-line or something like that. So it took decades for the, the league to sort of slowly march to closer testing. And then finally the 20 kilohertz test augmented by the two kilohertz test is kind of standard today. So the problem was radios with a wide first IF, and then of course up conversions came along and that guaranteed it had a first wide, an IF that was wide. So uh, we really had a limitation for like 15 or 20 years where even though the 20 kilohertz dynamic range test was in the 90s, which sounds excellent, but the close in two kilohertz test was in the 70s. And that was okay for sidebend, and I'll explain that later, but not for CW or RIDI and D expeditions and things like that. So I've also been asked, well, how did I test all these radios? There's like over 150 on my website. There's some receivers, but mostly transceivers. And in the uh, 1980s, there was a local ham store that's now HRO, but it was locally owned at the time. And I would borrow transceivers that were there on consignment, or maybe they'd been traded in. And actually, Alan Applegate, you may know him from, um, if you're into mobile or something, he'd let me borrow radios and I'd test them. And then say in the last 10 or 12 years, uh, I would borrow radios from hams. I certainly can't own everything. And occasionally I would buy one. Like there was so much interest in the new ICOM 705, about the size of a brick, and the FTDDX10, which is a cheaper version of the 101D. Uh, I bought those, tested them, used them in contests, and then sold them. But that's sort of the anomaly. And then in the last 14 years or so, I've been uh, doing hands-on evaluations in contests which is really kind of augmented just numbers. I mean, numbers are fine and it's nice to have the numbers, but it's, it's uh, important to know what, how does it really play on the air? So here's my contest station out east of Fort Collins. I really put a lot of emphasis on antennas, antennas as you can see. I mean, really location, antenna, operator skill, and then maybe which radio you pick. And we have lots of different radios we can pick today. Here happens to be uh, one of three operating positions at uh, that QTH. And uh, sometimes I'll be running two different rigs in a contest and I'll just change chairs to get a feel. Well, which one do I like? 
which one may have a feature or the other one doesn't have or something like that. So here's some examples of that where I'm running two radios in a given contest, like my old standard pure analog 781 versus the newer FTDX 5000D. Well, the band scope, which was an option on the 5000D was about an inch high and kind of useless. So in that case, the 781, which may have been the first transceiver that had a built-in scope, and of course it had a CRT back then. So that was a big difference. This would be a little surprising. One year I ran the 7300 and the TS990S. I'll talk about that in more detail, but those um, worked quite well, even though they were totally different price ranges and sized radios. The uh, TS590S and the 10 Tech Eagle, about the same size, about the same price, but it was easier to use the Kenwood. The Flex 6300 and the Maestro, which is like an external uh, uh, control panel, and then the ICOM 7300. And in that case, the QSK or even the semi break in was better on the ICOM than it was on the Flex and the Maestro. So that was sort of a surprise. I've run the KX3 in a couple of contests. As I mentioned earlier, I actually ran it from Easter Island, but compared to the Pro 3, the Pro 3, that was a very popular rig and I owned one for, I don't know, 10 years. The AGC attack distortion on CW drove me nuts. So I preferred the KX3, which is you know a fraction the size to the Pro 3. And then the Apache was interesting. Warren NR0V is now lives nearby and I was, using the 200D in a C to be a contest on 160. And the selectivity just seemed terrible comparison to the 7610. So I got Warren on the phone and he says, oh, the, the defaults for the DSP filtering were wrong. And so I clicked a few uh, uh, check marks here and buffers here and change thing. And suddenly the filters just work great. So that was a case where, you know, the capability was there, but the default as the, uh, Software would come up wasn't right, so he had to make a change there. In the last few years, I've really tried to make very certain that I got a random sample of a radio. You know, technology has changed and different software versions on a radio, or um, maybe it was tweaked. Well, I don't want a tweaked radio. So I really want to know if, when I test a radio and put the information up on my website that it's a typical radio, just like you would get. Now, of course, there'll be a minor variation, but you know nothing that uh, was like run through the lab, so I got a special version. We don't want that. Uh, all transceivers today, I consider them software defined, even if we kind of use the term as though it was run with a computer like Flex or Apache, but every radio is so full of software firmware today that they're, they're kind of in the same boat. As far as a random sample, Kenwood is really nice to me about that. I can go to HRO Denver and pick a random box off the shelf when a new radio comes out like the 990 did or the 890 did. And I take it home, test it, use it on the air and then return it to a Kenwood. So that's a random sample by just definition. For brands that don't sell through dealers, and I don't want you know, them to get send me a you know really checked out version, I want a random sample. I have to borrow the rigs. That would be the case like the K4 that I spent along with uh, N0QO. We spent three weeks trying to evaluate the K4, and that was borrowed from a ham in the east. So thank goodness we were able to um, you know borrow radios that it just wasn't practical to get a hold of because you can't just order a K4 today and have one. So don't just focus on receiver performance. That's what's on the website. And over time, maybe I'll have some transmit data too, but I don't have you know 30 years of transmit data, unfortunately. So the 10 Tech Orion 1 started a new trend. We'd had those up conversion radios for like 15 years. And that meant the first IF was above 10 meters or above six meters. And that was really a compromise on CW or RIDI. And so the 10 tech Orion went back to a nine megahertz IF, like we had way back years ago when the first radios had a nine meg IF and we had 80 meters and 20 meters with a single VFO frequency. So that was a change. And over time, the amateurs figured out that the upper conversion radios didn't compete any longer. And then of course the K3 came along and uh, really 
that was a major change. And uh, most of the expeditions, you know, for multiple reasons, good performance, small size, uh, the K3 really was a popular product. So the receivers have improved amazing amounts in the last 15 or 20 years. And almost everything today is a hybrid superhead or a direct sampling. A hybrid superhead meaning it's got a direct sampling band scope, but otherwise it's kind of a normal superhead or the direct sampling like Flex, ICOM or Apache. But really transmitters have gotten worse and that's in reference to the Collins 30S3, which I'll show you some uh, screenshots in a while. So we need to see if there isn't a way to get the transmitters improving the way that we've seen receivers improve, an amazing amount. Well, the other limit we really have to deal with is the fact in an urban environment, noise has gone up a lot. I moved to Denver in 1969, and I would say between 1969 and 2019 that urban band noise has gone up at least 3 dB per decade, and that's a lot over time, maybe worse than that in some cases. Line noise seems to be worse than it was back in the 70s. Wall warts today that charge all sorts of fancy things, whether it's our watch or our phone, they're switching power supplies and they often make birdies. They're switching power supplies in our computer and maybe peripherals we've got in the shack making a, a birdies that wander around the band. Our household appliances like your dishwasher, your washing machine, your refrigerator has microprocessors in it and they make noise. Some LED bulbs are noisy, some aren't. And then DSL, VDSL can have leakage that isn't supposed to really be there, but guess what? It causes interference. And then at least some of us are so uh, non-lucky to have pot growers in our area. And sometimes those thousand watt light bulbs that people are growing pot in their basement can irradiate over blocks and blocks. So why isn't a great receiver alone adequate. You know, if we have great DSP selectivity today, you can adjust the bandwidth and the skirts are sharp. But you know, if the interfering signals in the pass band and it can be sideband splatter, and I'm sure we all have heard sideband splatter a guy up the band five kilohertz or more, and we're hearing his buckshot in the pass band or key clicks on CW, you'd hope you could work a weak station right next to, say, you know, a 500 hertz or a kilohertz away from a strong CW signal, but sometimes you can't. And we'll have a picture of that coming up. And then if we're kind of line of sight, and line of sight could be a mile, it could be five miles, uh, that can be a problem with transmitted composite noise. Composite noise means phase noise and AM noise combined. And that's what we hear in the air. We don't just hear one or the other, we hear the combination of the two. So what numbers are most important in a multi-signal environment? Of course, if we were up on 10 meters this past weekend, there were a good, good amount of e-skip, but there's only you know 10 signals in the band. That's not a big deal. But in uh, crowded conditions, we really have to say, what is the dynamic range of the radio? Wide space, they're almost always good, but close in, not always, although things have changed dramatically there. So we have a lot of choices that are just amazing for CW and RIDI and things like that. We need the noise floor, even though receivers are more than adequate. I'll get phone calls or emails. I wanna work more DX. What receiver is more sensitive? And that's kind of silly because they're all great. They're, they work on six meters now, they work on 10 meters, but we do need that number. We have to measure it so that we can calculate the dynamic range when we're, we're in the lab. Reciprocal mixing, that's a new term from 2012 that the league came up with. It deals with the synthesizer in your radio, whether it has a clean phase noise or not, or if it's a direct sampling your radio, the clock. Transmitted broadband noise, I mentioned it's not, it's more likely a local problem. And then of course, sideband splatter, we know what happens there in the key clicks. If you are a CW operator, that can be real annoying. And there've been some just terrible examples in contests that I happen to run into on 10 meters. So what has improved in recent years? Well, the used to be probably for the, the life of the early synthesized radios and certainly the up conversion radios, the synthesizers were basically terrible. And they offered nice things like no drift and digital readout and general coverage, but they weren't very good. So 
the reciprocal mixing dynamic range, the phase noise quality of your local oscillator has really improved. And often that then improves the transmit noise. So that broadband noise that we we're worrying about at times, well, if the receiver got better, the transmitter usually got better too. Not always equally, but there's four examples, the K3S, the expensive ICOM, and the most recent to Yezu. Really good, even close in as far as transmit noise. Uh, and the TS-890S and the 7610, a little further out, they're about equally good. So that's a big improvement. And really, we have to say, Yezu, thank goodness you got your act together. Up until these latest three radios that have come out from Yezu, the 101D, the 101MP, and the FTDX10, their synthesizers were terrible, and the transmit noise was just awful. So uh, great. They've really, really uh, pushed in the envelope now, and thank goodness for that. So we say, okay, what's this reciprocal mixing dynamic range all about? We don't listen to the local oscillator, but here's what happens. Let's say we have a weak signal and that's the little bullet nose signal on the left. That's the weak guy we're trying to work. And nearby, and nearby is sort of relative, but nearby, let's say we have a really strong signal and it could be a perfect signal that doesn't exist in the real world, but it doesn't matter if it was perfect or not. If there's noise on the local oscillator, it mixes with the strong signal and puts noise sidebands on that strong signal. Now you would hope that that noise sidebands falls off in a Gaussian way like over on the right. It doesn't always, and there's some radios that that noise sidebands are just flat. That strong signal that could be causing a problem might be 100 kilohertz away or 200 kilohertz away. So we really don't want to see these uh, synthesizers that just had a flat response. So this is something that is now, really we've gone over the hump that the uh, synthesizers can be really good. So let's look at some signals on the air and some contests. This is a uh, Kenwood TS-890S on 10 meters in 2018 for the ARRL. 10 meter context, which is a mixed contest if you want to work both sideband and CW. It's probably a good idea since you never know whether you're going to get any e skip on sideband at a given moment. So, of course, this was at the bottom of the sunspot cycle. So, this was an interesting uh, way to evaluate a receiver. There was still plenty of interference, as you can see with the waterfalls and a lot of stations close together, and there were over 20 just in a 10 kilohertz bandwidth. And so you can see in the upper right-hand corner, I was running the preamp, which makes sense. It's 10 meters, I'm in a quiet location. Now to explain um, how we want to decide that. And also in the lower right-hand corner, audio peak filter, that's really helpful. It reduces noise. I don't usually run a, you know, a 50 Hertz bandwidth or even a hundred Hertz bandwidth, but I like to take the sort of the edge off the noise with the audio peak filter. Well, how do you know whether you're going to turn that preamp on or not? Well, it's something called antenna noise gain. And if you can switch between a dummy load and your antenna on a given band, and particularly the upper bands in this case, if the band noise goes up a noticeable amount, well, then you're fine. If you switch to your antenna and you can hardly hear the antenna connect, well, then you better turn your preamp on. So that'll give you a away without making a measurement. You can measure it, of course I measure it, but if just if it's obvious that the noise went up when you connected the antenna versus the dummy load, that's, the, that's a good choice of the preamp or not. So here's the opposite end, 160 meters. That was actually the weekend before in 2018. More QRM, we can certainly see that. Over 30 stations in a 10 kilohertz bandwidth. And this happened to be an ICOM 7610. And there's a lot of information here that I didn't even realize when I took the picture. Well, look at the upper middle, you see the audio peak filter has got a red arrow pointing to it. So of course I was running that just like I did on 10. But over on the left, of course, this is 160. I don't have the preamp on, that would be craziness, unless you were using a beverage or something. But I've got 12 dB of attenuation. And you say, well, how can I hear? Well, remember that band noise varies drastically from 10 meters to 160 meters. Typical 
daytime band noise on 10 versus 160 band noise at night is 30 dB more noise on 160, 30 dB. Well, our receivers are sensitive enough for 10 or six meters. So they've got so much sensitivity, noise floor capability on the low bands that you can run an amazing amount of attenuation and you lose absolutely nothing. So here's a case that we do this kind of the opposite where I mentioned on 10 meters, you would compare band noise with your antenna versus a dummy load. And if it didn't make much difference, you turn on the preamp. Well, here, if you were on 160 or even 80 meters and you turned on your 6 dB attenuator, which most rigs have that option, I bet nothing changed. The S meter is probably still reading up scale just by ear, nothing changed. Well, maybe you punch in the 12 dB attenuator. And if you're lucky, maybe the band noise dropped a little bit, you know, tuned between, in between signals. And that's a good starting point. So why do you want attenuation on 160 and 80 and even 40. Well, on 160 and 80, the ground wave is pretty amazing, particularly 160. And you may have a local station five miles away that's like 70 over nine, 80 over nine, who knows? So if you run the attenuator, you're gonna reduce the chance of overload. But really even more important than that, you don't want your AGC running on band noise. Well, of course, if the S meter is reading upscale, you know it's running on band noise. But if you're on CW, it won't go upscale as much. But if you can run attenuation so that the AGC thresholds above band noise, a noticeable amount, you know, 6 dB, maybe 10, well, then the fatigue factor of noise is going to be much less. In between stations, and now I'm not a operator that can run on CW, so I do search and pounce. So I'm always tuning between stations. So every time I tune between a station that I've worked, I don't want to hear band noise just as loud as every other station. So here was a case, as I mentioned, the 7300 and the TS-890S. There wasn't a new radio to test that contest. So I said, okay, let's pull out these radios that I haven't used for maybe a year and compare them. And they're vastly different in price and size and all that. So the little 7300 only has one attenuator, 20 dB. It's either on or it's off. So to make it a fair comparison, I set the Kenwood at 18 dB. So that was close. To, and I actually couldn't believe how much I liked it. I'd only run 12 dB in the past, you know, who knows, five or 10 contests on 160. But running 18 dB, which is maybe a little counterintuitive, but your radio has 30 dB of sensitivity to burn on 160. So 18 is okay. It was really like Nirvana because I tune between stations and maybe 5% of the time, I'd have to turn the volume up because there would be a weaker station there. But like 95% of the time, they're all still above AGC threshold, but the noise was just so amazingly non tiring because it was almost not in the picture. What else happened when I took this picture just to show density of the signals really? Well, look over there on the left. There's a signal marked key clicks 5X. And you can see how wide that CW signal is on the band scope. He's almost a whole division there, horizontal division. And then you go over to the right where it says clean. That station's only three dB weaker, but look how much narrow that station is on the band scope and the waterfall. I mean, look on the waterfall. He's hardly taken up any space. But over back on the left again, where it says Key Clicks 5X, that band scope looks terribly wide. So he shouldn't be cluttering up the band like that. And then you can even see a little signal peeking up there on the left edge of his Key Clicks, trying to peek through. You can see it on the band scope, and you can see it on the waterfall as little dots. So that's a case where we really need to operate our rig in a different way. And I'll give you details how to do that down the road just a little bit. So we saw an, a CW signal that's too wide causing QRM. Well, what about sideband? So right now, we really only have one option to have an amazingly clean signal on sideband. And it happens to be with Apache and some software written by Warren Pratt, NR0V, and he named it Pure Signal. Think of, it as, think of it as inverse distortion, or like 
negative feedback, but a little more complicated than that. And so look at the signal on the right that says pure signal and look how straight up and down, it's just a rectangle. Now that's a local station in Colorado and he's in a hi-fi SSB. So he had his bandwidth set to 4.6 kilohertz. I don't do that or wouldn't do that if I had this radio, but you can see that there's no wings on his signal from splatter. But we look on the left and that signal is sort of typical for a strong signal, you know, not S5 or something, but a strong signal that this distortion sidebands, the intermod products are really obvious. So wouldn't it be nice if we all had a signal that was just a rectangle straight up and down, like on the right. And right now we only have one company that offers that, but maybe in the future there'll be more. So let's take just a quick break. Uh, before we go to the transmitters, do we have any questions before uh, we do Q&A at the end of the talk? Moderator? A uh, question for you, Rob. Yes. That I think fit into something way back. Uh, you were talking, when you were talking about noise, there's a question I'd like to throw out is, is noise, is overall band noise accumulative? In other words, if you got a million nine hundred megahertz signals out there, does all that noise accumulate or offset itself? Itself. Well, in a way, you could answer that by this question of: Do direct sampling radios have more trouble with a band full of signals or versus a few? And the answer is basically no, because signals add up as voltage if you're looking at a direct sampling radio. So, uh, and of course you've also got the possibility of transmit noise, but that's probably, that's, you know, hopefully way down compared to the main signal. So I don't think from a receiver performance standpoint, they add up to any significant amount. It's just where well, you have atmospheric noise, galactic noise, noise from all these electronic devices, and uh, all the signals, and they just sort of are as they are. So uh, I don't think you would say they just add up. They just, they mean they're spread out over a lot of frequency range too. Okay. That, make, that makes sense? <laughs> yeah, the, <clears throat> the reason I ask is, uh, and it's actually been a number of years ago now, a friend of mine that worked for a broadcast station, uh, went up to do a remote on top of a hill outside of Baraboo. Wisconsin, and their remote was on 900 megahertz. And he commented when he got on top of that hill with their remote unit, they could not use it because of all the 900 megahertz equipment that they were hearing from 360 degrees around them. Uh, their receive levels were well, well over what we would consider S9, but it just it just made it the cumulative amount of of signals out there. Uh, just made it impossible for them to do their remote. Yeah, and that's not a surprise. I worked with for KOA radio for 18 years and KUVO for several. And uh, oh, the transmitters are up on Lookout Mountain, at least they were at the time. And so you've got two things there. You've got receiver overload, and you've also got passive intermod that occurs on uh, towers and junk laying around the site. So you guys that maybe maintain two meter or 70 centimeter uh, repeaters, you're probably aware of the fact that you can't have loose hardware up there on the tower or even you know leftover stuff lying on the ground that touches each other and can cause rectification. But when, when your remote doesn't work, it could be uh, really one or two of the stations were the worst case. I mean, what I think we used to call Marty equipment, it really wasn't designed to uh, deal with that type of an RF environment. It's kind of like field day uh, for us that um, you've just, you're you just exceeding the dynamic range of the radios. And so it didn't matter whether there were 10 transmitters up there or probably two or three that the same problem existed. Now, aside from the passive intermod. Okay, thank you. Sure. Hey, Rob, can you see my screen? Uh, I see, uh, yeah, it looks like an SDR of some sort. Okay. That's right. And uh, six meters is open. All right. And uh, the three kilohertz segments where FT8 operates, 
are just jam packed with signals. This is different than communications used to be. Used to be you had one signal and one band pass. Now you've got uh, 50 signals in one band pass. What yes. kind of receiver or receiver settings work best when you have a huge number of uh, desirable signals all stuffed in that narrow bandwidth? Well, this is a different issue and absolutely good to bring it up. You know, so we're not worrying about all these signals outside the passband, whether they're close in or far apart, causing intermodulation and ending up in the passband. We're looking at measuring the dynamic range in passband, and that isn't done much. So that's probably an area considering how popular the WSJTX modes are, that we really should be looking at in-band distortion measurements, and that's valid. We've also got the limitation of WSJTX. Uh, Frank Donovan, W3LPL, who's you probably know if you're a contester at all, with along you along with K3LR and a couple others, have these big multi multi stations. So Frank was on actually 630 meters for a while when it first opened up, and he it sent me an email and said, "What is the dynamic range of WSJT?" Well, I couldn't measure it, at least with my <laughs> computer skills to know. Well, how would I measure software? But I can measure a system. So I measured, this was on 630 meters, and I used a 7300, a transverter out of Australia, and then uh, operating on 475 kilohertz, and looking at whisper signals. And this was during the daytime for two hours, between like noon and two, I believe it was, or one and three. and. I then said, okay, I'm going to put in an interfering signal in and see what when it starts to degrade copy of these whisper signals, which would be similar to your FT8. And there were two signals 500 to 600 miles away, and then some from the West Coast that were more like 1,000 miles away, but they were much weaker and didn't show up as often. So it came down that it looked like the dynamic range of WSJTX on whisper anyway was about 75 dB. So we, we know that we'll have a limit on the software. And then also what type of distor distortion products occur in band. And I think that's something that needs to be investigated further. That is right now, I don't think there's any published measurements on it. So it's a, it's a new area we should look at. All right, thank you. All right, very good. Well, let's move on. And we'll talk about transmitters. So this is the cleanest transmitter I've ever owned a Collins 32S3, slightly out of production. And it's actually the cleanest one that's been in my shack. And so the way we measure distortion products the proper way with a spectrum analyzer, and they always have cursors, is we'll put one cursor on the two test signals. It's a two-tone test. You know, their two tones are equal strength. And then we put the other cursor on whichever distortion product we're trying to measure. Third order is what tends to be quoted most, but even QST will list third, fifth, seventh, and ninth. So that's important data to have. So in this case, the third order product was 36.5 dB, if you look in the upper right-hand corner. And so that's the measurement that's the way you do it the right way. But for whatever reason, because advertisers like big numbers, um, starting some years ago, that measurement of 36.5 got 6 dB added to it, so it became 42.5. Now, that didn't make the distortion any better. It just made the number bigger. It's kind of like changing your speedometer from miles per hour to kilometers, and guess what? The number went up, but you're still going the same speed. Well, that's what we have, so we just have to live with it. But the thing to look at here is how wide is the distortion products on this Collins? Well, the screen is plus or minus 20 kilohertz. And the distortion products are down 80 dB. Now, you probably could never hear down 80, except maybe on 10 meters or something. But it's plus or minus 10 kilohertz. It's down 80 dB. That's amazing. So if we could only be that good with modern radios, which maybe we can do with uh, the pure signal, but otherwise not. So here's the second cleanest transceiver I've owned, and that was a 990S. It was only 2.5 dB worse at third order, but look at how much wider it is. The distortion products go on much further out. So instead of being plus or minus 10, 
with the Collins is about plus or minus 18, admittedly 80 dB down. Now here is a more typical, this was a K3, it's about 10 dB worse on third order. But in this case, at plus or minus 20, we're still not 80 dB down. But the real reason for this screenshot is to explain why on sideband, we were able to live with up conversion radios that had a dynamic range of about 70 dB, plus or minus a few, for like 15 years. That's all we had in new product. So in this case, if we look at the distortion product four kilohertz away from the two tones, well, the distortion product's down 45 dB. Now we don't transmit tones, we talk, and so the distortion products aren't gonna be there solid. So let's say the distortion products with typical voice were down 50 dB or 60 dB. Well, the typical radio today, in the, my list that you'll see in a while, there's over 20 radios that are 88 dB or better. So here's a TS590SG, it costs $1,400 new. And then the 590S isn't much worse. And it's like, you can buy a used one for like $700. So if the dynamic range of the radio is the high 80s and the splatter distortion on sideband four or five kilohertz away is 60 dB down, you'll see the radio is not the limit. We're not overloading the dynamic range of the radio. We've just got splatter in our pass band. So that is the, uh, the reason we really would like to see our signals cleaned up to not be that wide and why we got away with up conversion radios that were not very impressive on sideband, not CW. Well, now here was W6XX's class A signal. And that was with an FTDX 1000 Mark V. And look how clean that is. That puts everything else to shame. So we can approach that and maybe even equal that with pre-distortion, which um, if we could get more of the companies, the OEMs doing that, wouldn't it be wonderful? So here's something I hate to admit, actually Tom who's checked in today, took this picture and this is two different people talking. The bottom there is me with a Kenwood and it would be the same if I was on the ICOM and it's a strong signal. We're all within a, you know, like a 60 mile radius. And you can see that my signal at the bottom is like three times as wide as the main signal. Now I'm a little bit stronger than the gentleman talking with the Apache, but it, by, you can tell there's more purple there, but not that much difference. And so if we could all look like the Apache or if Flex would offer it and Eldercraft says the K4 will have it someday. So if, if three OEMs could offer it, wouldn't that be great? So we've looked at how wide signals are in sideband and we wish they were better, but what about CW? And I mentioned there was this 10 meter contest in the last year and there were two signals on the air that I just couldn't believe. One had key clicks 35 kilohertz wide. And of course I had to tune around to find him. And I wrote down his call. There happened to be another signal that had broadband noise 50 kilohertz wide. Now there was something wrong with this radio. I mean, I've never heard a radio that bad that skip that was 50 kilohertz wide. And I found him finally by tuning around and wrote his call down too. So we really need to be a good neighbor. Now here's something that you can fix on most of your modern radios that have a menu. You probably have the option to go in and set the rise time. And the difference in key clicks with a one millisecond rise time, which shouldn't even be offered by the OEM in their menu, versus a six millisecond rise time at a one kilohertz offset, the key clicks are 25 dB worse at a one kilohertz offset. So I wish the OEMs would not let you go below six or maybe five or four at the worst, but three and two and one verboten. So it really should flash up on the screen if you pick a stupid number that says, you just turn terrible key clicks on, you're gonna annoy your neighbors. But so far the OEMs, OEMs haven't done that. Here's what rise time looks like in the time domain. This happened to have been a 10 tech radio that went from three to 10. Three is still too fast. 10 may be a little bit slow, but you can see there, look how fast on the left, the signal comes up to full power. And the faster it comes up to full power, somewhat dependent on the waveform, 
versus coming up to full power much more slowly on the right, drastically changes those key clicks, which you just saw, 25 dB, going from one to six. So the transmit composite noise, I mentioned that one that was the radio had to have been broken, but if you're line of sight, it can really be a problem. And line of sight might be only half a mile away or maybe much more. So here's three different radios. We'll look at their transmit composite noise. Don't, don't worry about what dBC per hertz means and all that, but here's the K3. It's a big number and we like big numbers. And it's wonderful at 10 kilohertz. And it's only slightly improves at 100 because it's great right off the bat. Now the ICOM 7610, well, it's not as good at 10, but it's virtually identical at 100. So in that case, uh, if we're maybe one station on CW and another on sideband and we're you know, 100 kilohertz apart, you'd never notice the difference. But then there's the case of the Yezu FTDX 3000. Well, it's worse than all the other two at 10. It never gets any better, period. Remember a while ago, I mentioned that that the the noise of the local oscillator may be flat, and there's, here's a case where it is. Now, Ken N0QO went up to the station in Boulder and make, measured the radio. There was no question of what was going on, but we wanted to have some numbers. So what happened was the station up in the foothills, about a thousand feet or more above uh, the city of Boulder, went from a FT1000 MP, which actually was okay, to a newer FTDX3000 and pretty much wiped out the 15 meter band that was really popular with the station that had a stack on 15 meters that was about five miles away. But of course he was lower in elevation, so it was line of sight. So here's where it isn't every time a, a rig's got a bunch of noise, it's gonna cause a problem, but it can certainly if you're, if you're line of sight. Now this is kind of technical, and this is a picture of how to measure noise from a transmitter. And this happens to be one of the worst examples. The, the popular 7300 is uh, not great at 100 watts, but almost every rig gets worse at low power. And we have a lot of amplifiers today that you can drive to legal limit or it's rated power at like 30 watts of output. So, the league unfortunately doesn't have this model and they can only measure phase noise with the Rode and Schwartz FS UP noise analyzer. So you would only get the blue line. So if you look at the plot here, the one that starts on the left and it's blue and it goes down, 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 down to almost the bottom of the scale, you say, well, that's great, no problem. But unfortunately in this radio, the AM noise dominates. So there's a black line there that actually merges with the green line. The green line's the total noise, the composite noise. And you can see there at 20 kilohertz offset, the AM noise is 18 dB worse than the phase noise, but you'd never know that unless you had this either fancy piece of test equipment for 150,000 or some other way to measure it. And that can be a Perseus, a Flex, or an Apache. So you can make this kind of measurement not quite as fancy with a graph, but you can you know, take the numbers down by hand. So to prove that phase noise and AM noise add up, as you'd expect, when they're equal, they should add up and be 3 dB stronger. And that's exactly the case. If you look at 150 Hertz, where the blue line and the black line intersect, the green line is 3 dB higher, which is, it had to be, because that's just the definition, how they add up. So the next slide will have some information you might want for a future field day, or if you have a ham that's nearby and you hope he doesn't have a rig near the bottom of the list. I don't, don't expect you to memorize this, but if you want a PDF of the presentation, you can look at the numbers later. So this was combined information from uh, Robbie in, from S53WW, some information from Ken and 0 qo and some data that I took. And it was a bunch of rigs, some of which we both made the measurements and they were pretty similar, which was good. Or some cases I had data that Roby didn't have or vice versa. So you just hope you would be, have the better numbers if you've got a situation where your station's relatively close by. So that's just some data you can look at later if that happens to fit your needs for deciding what are you gonna take to field day? I don't know if you read my article in November, 2019 QST. And 
the league came up with the title, it's time to clean up our transmitters. And on the tip of the hat to the league to kind of poke a stick in the eye of the OEMs because they're not paying attention to this part of the equation. We've got one of receivers and the transmitters are just lagging by decades. And it was interesting that the same issue, November, 2019, they also were testing the expert 1.5K FA linear amplifier with and without Apache's pure signal. And just with the third order measurement, it was 17 dB better with pure signal. And of course, you saw those pictures, this rectangular straight up and down, or guess what? They got splatter sidebands. So unfortunately, solid state linear, and I'll use the term linear in quotes, aren't so linear compared to what we used to have with tubes. Of course, with tubes, most of them we had to tune manually. There were a few that you didn't. So the league published a list of tube amplifiers from 1997. And every one of them had intermod with the PEP method. That's the add the 6 dB to make the number bigger. So we'll just stay with PEP for this comparison. All the third order intermod was down 40 to 50 dB PEP. Well, they also in QST reviewed the KPA 1500 and the intermod on 20 meters was down 30 as opposed to 40 or 50. Uh, CAN N0QO tested the Power Genius and it was 30, a little bit worse on 10 and six and a little bit better on 40. And then QSE, QST tested the one that we just saw, the expert, and it was minus 30. So almost all the LD MOS, LD MOS amps are about minus 30 PEP. But what if I've got a cleaner transmitter? Well, probably don't have the Collins on the air, but if I have a TS990S that I had for several years, it's minus 40. Well, if I take my minus 40 better than typical by 10 dB rig and run it through a typical amp, then I'm 10 dB worse, which is too bad. Here's an example of a graph showing the input output curve in an amp is really helpful. So in this case, we're looking at the KPA 1500. Now, admittedly, it's not as clean as a tube, but in this case, the blue line on the left is pretty straight, at least up to a kilowatt, and it starts to compress a bit. So I probably run the KPA 1500 at a kilowatt. But then QST reviewed the ACOM 1200S. Now that's an LD MOS amp also. In this case, the 20 meter graph is red for some reason, and it's pretty straight up to 700 watts, but then look, it almost goes horizontal. Well, not quite horizontal, but way too much compression. So I would never run that over 500 watts. And they actually published the data at a kilowatt and at 500 watts, and it was way better at 500 watts. But I, the average owner probably doesn't know that. So the bottom line today, the performance of all six, our major OEMs, our receiver excellent. And we really need to deal with the, what we'll just call noise, splatter noise, CW key click noise, or broadband noise. So as the consumer, well, we kind of get what we buy unless we decide not to buy something that's not up to what our standards are. Competition drove receiver performance, amazingly improved over 15 or 20 years. 100 dB radios are in the middle of the pack, which you'll just see in a moment. And the OEMs finally learned how to design really good synthesizers. I mean, drastically better compared to 15 or 20 years ago. But we won't get better transmitters unless we say we need better transmitters or we're not gonna buy your rig. So here is a page of uh, information from my website, but it's not just the first 21 transceivers on the list because there are duplicates. Well, why is that? Well, like the K3 came out in 2008 and then the K3S, and I also compared a K3S to a Flex 6700 on 10 meters. Plus all the direct sampling radios have more variation from sample to sample because each ADC chip, analog to digital converter chip is slightly different. So there's probably two of several of the uh, rigs that are give you an idea of the the spread between the direct sampling rigs. But look at this. We've got the little ICOM 705, which is 160 through 70 centimeters with an 88 dB diamic range. 
clear up to 110. So 100 dB or 99 dB is right in the middle. We couldn't have bought that 25 years ago. We couldn't even dream of that. And the price range from $1,000 to more than 12,000. I've run 15 of those 21 in at least one contest. And you wonder, well, do I have to spend $3,000 or $4,000 or $5,000 to be competitive in a contest? Well, N2IC used to live in the Denver area. Now he's in, in New Mexico. He has a pair of TS590s. And they're, a 590 SG is like $1,440. So you don't have to spend a fortune to be competitive, but you're probably going to need some good antennas. So we finally have some data on the K4. And I borrowed one, and Ken and I in Zero QO had it for three weeks. It came from a ham in the east. And uh, the numbers have been on my website now for several weeks. So it's like pretty much all the direct sampling radios. It's around 100 dB radio. And it's uh, ADC overload point is uh, actually a little bit better than some, but they're similar, but some are as much as 10 dB lower. It's kind of like half of a 7610 meaning you can be on two bands at once, but the input filtering, the LC input filtering has to go broadband, but you can still do it. Where the K4D is pretty much like a 7610, two independent receivers with independent front end filters. So that's sort of how they fall is in similar uh, design. The HD, which doesn't exist yet, will make it more like a K3 or K3S. So it can have roofing filters. You know, a direct sampling radio, by definition, doesn't have a roofing filter. So you can put up to six roofing filters in the K4HD. Hopefully, we'll see it this year. So there was a lot of time spent. Kind of surprising. There were a lot of firmware issues that we came up with. AGC issues, CW timing, some audio issues with distortion. All that data has been sent on to uh, Elecraft, and they're working on it. Some of the things that we've talked about with Wayne have been already implemented uh, in the last, let's say, three weeks, four weeks at the most. So um, over time, I'm sure all those things will get addressed and hopefully they can all be fixed in firmware. That's why we like these. All these radios, whatever design they are, consider them software defined because they're all full of software. So what came out in the last year? So I've got a little bit of data on contesting with the ICOM 705 and the FTDX10. I didn't get to use the FTDX 101D or the MP on the air. It, I got it just in time before Contest University slash Dayton, what, two and a half years ago. It ran through the lab. It went to California for a, an update, came back, retested, off to back to its owner. So I don't have any contest data on the K4 or the K4D, but come December, I should have that. Um, in a really difficult RF environment, like field day or a ham, you know, 10 blocks away, the uh, HD would probably be recommended and the K3S would outperform the K4 in those limited cases. I would never see a signal overload, an S, uh, a K4 or a 7610 out in the country where I live. My closest ham is AI0L and he's 12.7 miles away. And when we're on 10 and 15 meters with our beams pointed at each other, running legal limit, we're only 30 over nine. Yet the direct sampling radios, they're gonna overload at like 65 over nine or 80 over nine, depending on uh, how you have the gain set up. I did find the uh, K4 really liked the mouse, or at least I liked the mouse because a lot of things to punch on with my finger and I, the mouse was helpful. So some comments on the 705, and uh, I've really talked to them, uh, quite a few of them on the air, you know, parks on the air, summits on the air, uh, somebody just on vacation. The numbers are pretty much like a 7300 with IP plus off. What's that mean? Well, that's linearization built into the chip on the 7300 and the 7610, but not on the 705. But so far, no one's ever told me they can hear a difference turning on that linearization feature. But that's probably because on the lower bands, distortions in the ADC chip that are in all the direct sampling radios are low enough, they're covered up by band noise. But it'll be really interesting in the next 
three, four, five, six years, when we peak out on the sunspot cycle, and 10 meters and 15 meters are just like gangbusters with low band noise, way lower, like 30 dB lower than 160, and see if we can hear a difference with that linearization on. But for now, hardly hard worth worrying about. Of course, there were all sorts of VHF features I didn't use. I really did like the ergonomics. The screen works just like a 7300. It's the same size as a 7300. And um, it has a common user interface over all the current models, the 7300, the 7610, the 9700, VHF, UHF, and now the little portable one. They just came out with in the last month with a new feature for the band scope, a scrolling feature that's major improvement for uh, someone that's a search and pounce operator that is not just on one frequency calling CQ. So what did I do with the ICOM 705? I ran it in three contests. I didn't run QRP, it was driving an amp. I really, really wanted to say, how good's this receiver? I ran sweepstakes for just 100 cues. I just did the 100 cues and just for fun, no problem. I did run it kind of an acid test, the 160 meter CW contest. I worked almost 400 stations, search and pounce. I worked two JAs, 80 sections. That's the US sections and the Canadian sections. And I was on the air a little over 16 hours, kind of tired. And then I ran it in the next weekend's 10 meter contest. I didn't have a good headset and trying to run a contest on sideband with a push to talk hand mic was not fun. I had a headset that I got from Heil, but it didn't work with Vox. So hopefully Heil will come out with a good headset that'll work with the 705. But anyway, it was fun. I enjoyed it. Great little radio, assuming you're gonna run QRP, which would be the main reason to buy it. FTDX10, well, it's only like $1,700 compared to over 3,000 for the 101. The ergonomics are a little bit iffy for me. The buttons around the VFO are kind of small. So I had trouble not pushing two buttons at once. There was a major firmware update in April and May before the waterfall history. And what's the purpose of a waterfall? So you can see what's been going on for the last 30 seconds or maybe a minute. And you can tune in a station that's on the waterfall. Well, guess what? Originally, you just transmit like one dead on CW or push the talk like, hello, all that information went away. Well, that was crazy. So I complained about that as did other people. And so with the April update, they fixed that with the 2D waterfall. But they really, in the advertisements, hype the 3D waterfall. I mean, the three-dimensional waterfall, the 3D waterfall. And it shows kind of like the opening of the original Star Wars. It's kind of disappearing into the ether. But that goes away if you just send one dit or if you push the talk, blip, it's gone. So I don't know what the purpose of it is. And the 101D and EMP have the same limitation with the 3D, but the 2D is fine now. So that's great. And also the key clicks have really been massively improved with the new firmware. Uh, I measured an MP about a week or two ago at 30 words a minute and 60 words a minute. And it was under 550 Hertz at minus 60 dB. Tremendous. So Yezu did a great job there. I worked only one contest with a 10, a little over 200 cues on 160 in January. Three JAs that time, 45 sections. I was only on the air for seven hours. The selectivity, great. Audio peak filter were great. The agronomics are kind of the weak point. I think they could improve the band scope with some averaging and all sorts of people have complained about even the 101D about needing averaging in the band scope. And you really do like a mouse again with the uh, FTDX10. It just helps navigating all these menus and things to click on or push on with your the uh, touch screen. So don't buy a radio with one number. And I maybe it's somewhat my fault. I mean, the, you go to the website and you can see all these radios sorted by close end dynamic range. And for CW and RIDI, this is really important. Sideband, I explain why not, because splatter usually dominates. But you don't buy a radio for one thing any more than you buy a sports car that go 150 miles an hour, but would go in the ditch if you go around the curve. So operator fatigue, at least for contesters and DXers, is important. And what can make it tiring to run a radio? If the audio is poor or the AGC doesn't work right, just things like that that you know seem pretty basic. 
if the ergonomics are kind of clumsy, well, that slows you down. We need a decent speech processor for sideband, of course. And now most of us live in an urban environment. And like I said, band noise has gone up drastically in the last 50 years. So noise blanking, noise reduction, how well does it work with different brands? That's a big deal. Is the firmware updated? ICOM's just been updating stuff. Yaze has been updating stuff. So this is important that we don't just get it. And even though it's software defined, if we don't get new software occasionally, well then what's the, what's the point? And warranty service. I mean, can you imagine most of us trying to fix the surface mount components that are the size of a grain of salt? So we're, we probably have to send it off to have warranty service done, hopefully when it's out of production. So how, how long is the radio gonna be supported as far as spare parts or service? And then the bottom line, do you enjoy using your radio? At the end of the day, the end of the contest, the end of the rag shoot, hopefully it was fun. If it was fun, that's great. That's all that matters that you, your radio does what you need. It doesn't matter what I need or somebody else needs. So it'll be time for a Q&A. I always look forward to your feedback and questions and something that I'll, I'll learn from you. The next slide will have email contact, but for full disclosure, what am I running in the past and the currently? Well, I've owned Drake, Collins, Kenwood, and Icom. Currently, I just happen to have Icom. So um, just so you know what I'm using in my shack. And there's my email address. If you want to send a question or want a PDF, and of course your club will have a copy of the uh, presentation too. So I'm going to quit sharing here and let it go back to you and let our moderator take it, take it from here. There, I was just having trouble un unmuting. So my uh, user interface wasn't uh, working as well <laughs> as uh, some of your radio. So that, that was a fantastic uh, presentation, Rob. I really appreciate it. So um, do we have um, uh, questions for, uh, for Rob? I've got one. Uh, Rob, this is Dave and 9 hf A simple question, and maybe you know this off the top of your head, maybe you don't. Is the rise time adjustable in a K3? I pulled out the manual while you were talking and I went through it and I couldn't find anything. It's not, but it doesn't matter because they didn't screw it up. They use a sigmoid waveform and the, and the rise time is about five milliseconds. I think the K4 needs to be slowed down a bit. You know, if it's done right, there's no reason to have to fool with it. But since so many radios now have menus to adjust everything, the OEMs went crazy. So you shouldn't be picking one or two and you shouldn't be picking, you know, something uh, probably above 10 if it was ever offered. ICOM goes from one to, uh, Kenwood goes one to six, so one's terrible and six is what you want. ICOM goes two to eight, so I'd pick six or eight. So you're right, the, the Elecraft is kind of the anomaly there, but they did it right, so it doesn't matter. Okay, thank you. I mean, Elecraft has always been heavily CW oriented, and so that's, you know, QSK and clean CW, that's not a surprise. Other questions? Oh, I have a question. Go ahead. I just wonder in the future, will there be a little more emphasis on six meters rather than stopping at uh, 10 meters on the way up? Well, I think every new rig covers 10, six meters today. I'm not aware of anything that doesn't. Now, certainly we go back um, far enough and it didn't, but then, you know, channel two went away in most locations and that was a big impetus to put six meters on the radios. Plus it wasn't a hard thing to do from a, an architecture standpoint, it wasn't like you, you were trying to <laughs> you know, take a Viking Ranger and put it on six meters. So uh, there was really no reason not to do it. And I can't think of a radio. Well, I guess my 7851, no, 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 no. The 781, which came out like 30 or 35 years ago, that quit at 10 meters. And it's the first one that had a band scope, but um, you know, that's, that's way back. So six meters is here to stay. I, I suppose I didn't phrase my question uh, properly. I, I meant when will the testing have more emphasis on six meters? 
rather than stopping at 10. Okay, well, I'm I'm uh, with my long form reports. Um, I'm now trying always to do six meter measurements. And so like the FTDX 10 or the K4 has got, it's got six meter data. Matter of fact, if you want K4 data, you go to nc0b.com slash K4, all lowercase, nc0b.com slash K4. And I think you go to nc0b.com slash 1010. And so, uh, you know, that's something that uh, I need to absolutely do all the time. Uh, I don't know that in QST how much they cover six, but um, I think what they should. So I guess we should all be uh, paying more attention. You will find that every radio I've ever run through the shack on six meters out in the country, you always need a preamp if you're in a quiet location. Otherwise that antenna noise gain I talked about, it would be one dB or less. So the, that would mean that with no preamp, the radio is totally limiting reception by the noise in the receiver. So every radio today that's covered six meters, if you're not in a noisy environment, if you're in an ur urban environment, it may be noisy, but you'll need that preamp. Thank you. Well, I'm going to stop the recording, and but we can still um, uh, chat informally. Yeah.